Ever since the El Paso mass shooting, hate crimes and white nationalism have, of course, been big topics of discussion and concern. Our next guest has a unique perspective, truly. Shannon Foley Martinez is a self described former white supremacist who's now an activist who speaks out against hate. Shannon, I've got quite a few questions I want to ask you about your own personal story from a self proclaimed white supremacist to an activist working to stop hate and violence. But I wanted to uh, tap into that unique insight w for a few questions. I wanted to start by asking, in your mind, what's the difference between a white supremacist and a racist? And does that difference really matter? It, I don't think that it actually matters when we're talking in the context of America. Racism is a structure of discrimination that is based on structures of power and who has historically held influence and how the structures of power uh, are built within a country. Um, but in America, that system is a white supremacist system. So it's a colonialist and white supremacist system. So then what do you think goes on in the mind of a white supremacist or within the white supremacist community when President Trump offers up some of the anti-immigrant, anti-people of color rhetoric and policies that, that he has uh, presented? I think they hear it um, as, uh, as hearing one of their own, that part of the, the premise of white supremacy, particularly um, when we are talking about personal white supremacy uh, as opposed to more like systemic white supremacy, that um, people are looking for others um, they are looking for a convenient group of others to blame for the problems that they see and that they don't know how to solve within their society. So what do you think goes through, well, I'm, actually, what goes through your mind when you see people at Trump rallies chanting things like send her back or joking about shooting immigrants? I mean, not every Trump supporter is a racist or a white supremacist, but they certainly seem to get into that spirit of things at those rallies. The first thing that goes through my mind uh, is sorrow, that I am sorry that there are still people in America who feel like they have to uh, defend the rights simply to even exist or to be citizens of this nation um, or to look to the American dream and still be dreaming it as uh, America is a, they still see America as this place that is better from, than where they came from, full of hope and promise. The other thing that I think is that uh, we have to do a better job really uh, talking about the language that we use and how it influences us. Cognitive lingu linguistics tells us that the metaphors that we use to frame ideas influence the solutions that we offer. So if we really want constructive solutions, then we need to do a better job more constructively framing the problems that face us rather than using incendiary language. Is it just groupthink that you think that, that, that you know, people might come to these ideas because they want to be a part of that group? Or do they want to be a part of that group because they have those ideas? I think it's probably both, that there is probably an individual dynamic and then there is also a group dynamic. We know from groupthink that when people are in large groups that they tend to go along with whatever the group is doing. But I do also think that there is um, an individual uh, aspect to it, too, where um, people want to align themselves with who they feel uh, has power and who they feel like is exhibiting power. And hate has very often, and that is certainly part of the allure uh, from that part of my life, that hate felt the closest that I could get to power. Well, that leads me to your story. I, I take it you weren't born a white supremacist. Had you always had, how did you, how did that become your identity? Um, I, I ended up having uh, several layers of trauma happen uh, in my early life, uh, some sort of systemic and then uh, some acute trauma. And so I took all of that and I just shoved it down on process. And the side effect was that I was rage filled, that I was so angry by the time I was like 15 years old. And the angriest people that were in the periphery of um, my life were the white supremacist skinheads. For people now, um, that, that, those ideas are out there everywhere on the internet. That is very easy to uh, be exposed and to encounter ideas um, that 
feel uh, like they offer a sense of belonging and a sense of empowerment from people who are feeling deeply disempowered, a sense of agency in your life. So, so for the, the white supremacists today and the rise that we've seen in white supremacists, do you think that they're suffering from traumas as well? Or is it uh, more of that, hey, here's a group that I, that I think I can be a part of and, and they share my anger? I think it's very complicated, but most of the people um, uh, who I know who have left uh, extremist movements of all kinds, uh, including the white supremacy movement, and people that I'm in the process of helping bridge the gap and uh, begin the new chapter of their life, that overwhelmingly uh, trauma is a part of this. And so not necessarily like uh, what we right now think of as trauma, like I was in a battle or I had a violent action, but experiences where they feel just essentially unsafe. So it's complex post-traumatic uh, disorder, things like that. But there is also this component of, I want to belong to something bigger than myself. I want to belong to something that feels like I have the ability to change the world. Um, and that it's colliding with the, this broken and twisted need set that individuals uh, are presenting with. So how did you get out of it? How did you stop being a white supremacist? And what are you doing now to try to help others follow your path? I was very lucky that at a point in my life when I was almost 20 years old that I didn't really have anywhere to live. That was lucky because uh, a woman uh, took me into her home, a single mom who was uh, the mom of three younger boys uh, and was the mother of a boyfriend that I was going out with who himself was a violent white supremacist as well. She was not. And she chose to look past all of this gruff and vile exterior and the things that I was saying and chose instead to see a hurting and struggling young woman that she compassionately and courageously took a chance on. She connected me with resources that I needed, helped me to start beginning to think about the future again, um, rather than just right now and pr rather than just being immersed in the echo chamber in which I lived. Um, and that was the beginning of my journey uh, outward. One of the things that I'm doing now is uh, I work trying to build preventative programming. I work trying to talk to parents about how to better inoculate your children so that they don't find resonance with extreme extremist ideology, so they don't find resonance with white supremacy, so they don't find resonance with those things. And then also I try to help people who are in uh, negotiate their way out and help them to, to rebuild their lives um, and heal and make the amends that is uh, an essential part of all of us who have been part of anything that we have ever deeply regretted that has done harm and wrong to other people. Shannon Martinez is a former, uh, a self-proclaimed former white supremacist, now an activist working to uh, try and bring people back from that realm uh, and also dealing with others as well. Shannon, thanks for the insight. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. And up next, we continue our series going to pot by looking at how one town is handling the legalization of recreational marijuana and what they're doing with all the revenue that new industry is raising.